Chasing Grayskull. You may be chasing Grayskull, but who you've caught is you've caught us, the makers of Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Here we are. Guys, how are you today? Good. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited, Rand. What? We are live for Kickstarter now, but we're recording this two days before it starts. Wait a minute. So we won? We beat Kickstarter? We won Kickstarter? We're on our way, hopefully. We're kind of looking into the magic uh, mystery eight ball of the future, and I'm I hoping we're doing well. I have the power! Our Kickstarter sales just went down. I don't just, have it at all. I was waiting. They're off. rising, I rising. Was, I, urge to fund, rising. You shall not. Wrong guy. I was close, though. I think. Ish. Yeah, not too bad. So no, it's good stuff. It is good to cover. Do you think stuff. right now, when people are looking at this, do you think Kickstarter is just going crazy? Yeah. I do. I really do. I think people are going to be talking about it. We've shared it with press by this point already, and I know we've had a lot, a lot yeah. of positive reactions to it so far. And it's been pretty encouraging because we just don't know, right? It's that guesswork as creators that we do. We just we think we're always doing the right thing, and then it's that kind of gut check. Listen, we should also say a lot of people who might have concerns about the language in that teaser, I didn't actually say the bad word, did I, guys? No. No, I can vouch for you. You didn't say any bad I, words. No, no, no. I refuse not to comment on that. <laughs> I refuse not to comment. You yes. are going to comment. You're going to. He's going to comment any minute. That, that was the comment. I accept. So let's introduce yeah. ourselves for those who remember who we are. Uh, I'm not Rob McCallum. I'm not Isaac Elliott Fisher. I'm not Mark Hussey. I'm Randall Lobb. I'm one of the writer and director team sharing with... Hey, Rob McCallum. And we're joined alongside our uh, master of lenses, Isaac Elliott Fisher. And back behind me on the old couch, yeah, master back, of computers. And back here, switching the show uh, and enjoying the show, watching you guys is uh, Mark Hussey behind the scenes, post production. <laughs> and You're literally, not this. and he's literally behind me. And there's my smoke alarm. <laughs> Whoa. Are we okay, that's, everybody? That's because this Kickstarter campaign's on fire. <laughs> fire. <laughs> yeah, and if you wonder what's happening, whilst we're P-casting, uh, Isaac's at his, his desk, his writing, his drawing table, rather. He's not, I don't think he writes much. His uh, art oh, table. I don't even know how to no, write. we don't. We encourage him not to. <laughs> no. Don't touch the keyboard! Uh, he's penciling and inking right now. Yep. That's why he's wearing that mitt. I, I took my mitt off. Do you want me to do you want me to to, to, to sneak any of these or no? No. Let's, 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 how let's dare you? How dare in. you? Don't do that. What are you doing? What are you Don't doing? Don't show that. <gasps> One of the things that is not on Kickstarter, he's actually uh, he's doing very tasteful nudes of each. No, he's not. He yeah. is of each of, of us. I was each saying, of us. I was it's definitely say, one of the. I couldn't yep. even say that out loud. Oh, kind of. Anyway, right now, Kickstarter is happening. Hopefully, everyone's checking it out. Everyone's looking at something that we put together way back before Christmas. Do we want to talk about that teaser, guys? Yeah, we can talk about the teaser. It's one of three things that we're going to talk about during this episode. Uh, definitely the most exciting, I think, for sure, because of it's yep. our first kind of chance to really collaborate with all the bells and whistles. Well, Rob, what did you think? Like You and I had talked about this like over the phone and Skype and stuff in advance. And obviously, Mark and Rand and I had talked about it as well. But you... Like you said, you we all hadn't worked together. So when you showed up, what were you expecting when it come to like you know a mm. set and location mm. and all that stuff? All of a well, sudden, I, everybody I, starts paying really close attention over here in Full Pop Station. <laughs> yeah, I walked in, and is Godrich, Ontario, which I hadn't. I, truth be told, I visited Godrich about six months earlier for the Kitty documentary. I'm working on at Beach Road, of course, with Siggy there. But other than that, I hadn't been to Godrich forever, and I actually had to keep asking for directions to where this place was, That's and true. found it very easily. Walked in, saw everybody kind of you know happy, happily working, and I remember just kind of looking like and gazing across the whole kind of set and what was up, kind of looking for the minefield. Where, where, what's going on? Where should I step? What's happening? And everything was kind of cool. Well, let, let me jump in. Were you concerned about the fact that there are two directors, uh, two kind of, I don't want to say captains of the ship, because that's not true. As you saw, we're super collaborative. Like, we're we're a really open team. And I, maybe you had some concerns about that or how that would work. I'm curious to hear that. 
Yeah, not really concerns. I mean, it's uh, I've never been in a situation where it's been like a full on co-directing thing for my film Missing Mom. I'm in front of the camera a lot. So in that respect, I'm co-directing with my friend Jordan Morris, who's behind the camera. But in this situation, you and I are behind the camera trying to make it work and make some of those top tier decisions. So I just wasn't sure how it was going to go. Uh, the early talks between all of us was, no, don't worry about titles. Don't worry about roles and what hats people are wearing you know, we all generally know what we're going to try to do and what we're trying to accomplish. So just trust the process that we have set up with Definitive Films yeah. and Faux Pop Media. So, um, well, yeah, you know, so it was, it was kind of wait and see. You know what they mean when they say that? I think what it comes down to is when they say don't worry about the hats, I think that's really super specific to the way we work where strictly from a hierarchical sense, best idea always wins. So... I think that's literally what they mean. We do wear the hats of our jobs, as you as you saw. But what happens is if somebody's, you know, if there's a camera operator who says to Isaac, hey, what about this? No, there's no cue. There's no hierarchy. There's nothing to uh, to lose by saying that. It's wide open in that regard. But it is kind of, it's disingenuous to say that we don't have those roles, as you saw, again, I think when you got here. And what we were shooting required... A lot of people doing a lot of different things. I mean, we built the yeah. set, we had props, we had an actor. And in that sort of scenario, it requires just so many moving parts that we need those people to help out. I mean, we recently shot an ad where we missed a few things because we didn't have, you know, we were focused on such specifics. So I was really glad when you showed up. And I think what we found out was... To, you could have you could have maybe two directors because you have so many things to which you need to attune, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah there's a, yeah. There's a lot of things going on in following the the action and yeah. following everything. I, I guess more interestingly, let let's throw it on Isaac. Mm. Isaac, you had pretty much you know done Turtle Power just with Rand and Conan, of course, and you're working on Shenmue, and you have another collaborator on Shenmue. But how was this different for you to have two directors kind of collaborate on this one you've never worked with? And yeah. one you had worked with, um, I tend to push the ship too hard. Usually, <laughs> I have ideas, and I'm pretty strong-headed, as we all are. We we all kind of, um, you know, not butt heads in a bad way, but we kind of all clash together in a good creative way. And and it actually is, uh, we oftentimes look back on it and say that any kind of friction in that arena it actually results in a better product. Um, so. I was kind of going into my autopilot mode of going, coming up with ideas visually for what the shot was going to be, what the set was going to be, what the, the action was going to be, and where I think the other guys were used to it. Um, I think you were probably a little bit surprised at the beginning. And, and it was, I don't know, maybe I'm reading that into, my, into it myself. I mean, um, it, it, was, uh, it was interesting to, to have to kind of communicate both to both directors at the same time because of the fact that you're also not here. That's another thing we should mention. You're in Vegas. Yeah. And we're and we're in, you know, God now, in Paris. No, of course I was, he was up here there. The yeah. Of course I was shooting on set with you guys, but yeah. Well I'll, yeah, I'll, actually that was the night that was the great thing is you were able to show up and set. On set, no, it wasn't any different. I mean, I'll I, jump I in here though. Yeah. Something that that maybe Rob doesn't know is that we let Isaac from a uh the perspective of some crews might say, no, 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 you don't do this, you don't do that. We'll let Isaac run uh, as far with preconceptions and stuff as he as he needs to do, um, and when I say let that again, that indicates something that's not there. But that process mm. is necessary for Isaac. Like he needs to feel all that lock into place, and I understand that he's putting gear in a trailer. He's pulling it out of a trailer. From I, and I think I can speak for Mark here, but maybe more for myself. I know what I want to see, but I don't want to say to him, do this, do this, do that, because I want him to interpret something. I want Mark to interpret something. I want you to come in and interpret something, and I want to tweak and push. I know my limitations technically, and I don't want to define so much in advance that I crimp the technical expertise, right? So right. some people yeah, some people would come in and say, well, you're, you're loosey-goosey or whatever, and I think what you would find out is, I'm not loosey goosey in my thinking. I might be loosey goosey in a sense of what I'm sharing. So I would elicit as much as I can from everybody around me. And then I, my skill set would be that I want to then kind of tweak and push. And there have been times in the past where 
I'll say I'm guilty of uh, not saying to someone, and of course we're all thinking the Steve Varner shoot, not saying, no, no, don't do this, do that, because I'm trying to defer technically. So I was yeah. interested from my perspective to see when you showed up, are you a technical director? Are you a, an actor director? Are you not like, and I don't mean, there's no slots to fill, but you know what I mean? What was your focus? Would you like Isaac to be pushy like he sometimes is? For us, we don't care. We're allowing that to happen. And then we'll get to a point where we butt heads and say, no, 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 don't do this, do that. And if the the methodology or if the argument or the decision making is clear, everybody will say, oh, okay, get it and you know, move forward. I, th- I've, I think the, the analogy for me is that you guys are more like sculptors where you guys start going as wide as possible and then you start kind of bringing it back. Like you let Isaac kind of go with his thing and then you kind of bring it back and you shape it and you form it where I'm probably used to more working like a painter where you're going for that defined goal and you're pushing maximum until that you get to that point. And then maybe as you get past where you think, then you bring it back. And I'm afraid of that. And that might be some of the source of if there are sure. conflicts down the road, what scares me is taking paint off the, taking paint off the canvas. I worry yeah. about that. And so that's an interesting analogy. Yeah, yeah it's like it's outward smart. in and and inward out. Well, that's I think I did the yeah, I, think, I think I did the hands wrong. Well, no, but what you said is exactly my language, right? Yeah. yeah. All my preparation is invisible. Like I don't want them to know everything I'm thinking because I don't want to have someone and, and look, I'm older and I'm loud and I've been teaching a long time, so sometimes I can bulldoze people by just I've so have so much reasoning behind what I'm doing and I don't want Isaac to then hold something back and say, oh, I don't want to have this confrontation, which he's guilty of doing at times, pulling back from confrontation. Mark's not, but there's this this sensibility when you have people on set, you want everybody to be able to go, this is an environment where we can all contribute as much as possible, and I think we get really good results. And when you showed up and we started working with Cohen and you you started to, it didn't take long before you started to feel totally comfortable, my estimate, or my mm-hmm. estimation, and you started to be able to build what you wanted to build and see how you know you're pulling off. Um, I guess I, I, I did wonder about that because I felt like somebody who was for all our American watchers, you may not know what curling is, but I felt like we're kind of having you know playing a game of curling because we're doing the shot, and of course it's all MOS, right? So <laughs> yeah. th- there's no sound that yeah. we're recording, and Sweet. I'm sitting there. I'm just like, play harder, yeah. hard, play hard. Okay, go to the grayscale, yeah. hold up the sword. Yeah. yeah, You know, and you guys are kind of really kind of quiet and reserved. Yeah. And I'm kind of a loud guy. Yeah. And so now I'm screaming at a monitor <laughs> while Cohen's over there playing. I was yeah. like, I, this is just kind of what I feel is kind of right. And I'm sure you guys would have said something. Well, and- no, I think, I think that was that, that was, I think what Rain was talking about right there when it came to like the comfort level, because you felt you, it was obvious that everybody felt like they could go there, right? That, like, you know, in, yeah. the, in that moment, you could do that mode. Um, and I think that was good. I think it, it, like I say, there was nothing about on the day that, that struck me as, as this wasn't working for any reason. Except I think- the TV. Yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. what I was to get to is that <laughs> that's it, what the it's, it's all react it's it's all reactive at yeah. that point where and that's where we kick into high gear and I and I love that as much as I swear and get all angry in the moment but I love that problem solving moment where it's like okay you know well uh, we, so let's we, let's talk about that yeah well, we, we had a lot rewind, of problems the story on this. rewinds further back than that yeah because, it does. Um, we had discussed and kind of come up with the, we'd all agreed upon the kind of a shot uh, that was going to happen where a young kid was going to come home from school and he was going to go in the house and put down his backpack and go to his room or something, get a get a toy and go through a little This is going to be this awesome like Aaron Sorkin walk and talk, yeah. whooshing kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it was all going to be flying camera and he's going to end up at the, at the screen and do roughly the same thing as he ends up doing in the trailer. But... Um, the location that we had fell through at the last possible second. And we had um, another option. But I was glad when it fell through. Yeah. 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 I think Rand was was happier when it fell. And, and that in retrospect, I as much as I was really frustrated with that, and it takes me a few minutes to kind of like stop the train, back up the train, switch tracks, move down. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually my fear. I don't ever want to be in the place where I'm doing that. I never want to be so stuck on a concept that I'm, I'm adrift. And you know, right? But it's not—it's not necessarily I, in my own defense. If I, I don't have to, well, defend. why are you? There's nothing to defend. Yeah. No, there's nothing to defend here. But I guess, for lack of a better term, 
it's the fact that the machine in the train is already moving down that track from a technical perspective. I'm already prepping gear in my head, mm-hmm. even if I'm not oh, physically doing it, uh, whatever, or finding props that are specific to that set. So then when at the last second we said, okay, well, regardless, we had a location that was very 1980s or, or late 70s, 1980s, but we didn't have a television for that location. So we'd already gone through an interesting process of finding that giant, you know, big floor-mounted model television, which actually was a cool story in itself because we had gone some props departments at local theaters, which have mm. very expansive props departments, but they didn't have the right television. And I was returning the key to the front desk, and the lady at the front desk is like, oh, did you find what you're looking for? I said, no, it's unfortunate I was looking for this big television. And he, she goes, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I really want a big floor mounted TV. And she goes, my dad's been trying to give me one for the past couple of weeks. I was like, what? <laughs> so we were, I was in Blythe, so I drove up a half hour up to Teeswater, and sure enough, her dad, you know, let my brother and I lug this 60, 70 pound nice box. Console, in yeah. basement. And it worked. It worked. I mean, and, and then right up arrived. to the shot. <laughs> right up to rough rise. And the funny thing was, is that the day before, one of the, the grip had been playing his Atari on the television. He said, it smells kind of hot. So I said, don't leave it plugged in just in case. We don't want to burn down the studio. And uh, sure enough, we had it running yeah. for, we had, and also, we had a computer converting it through two or three conver- conversions to get onto channel three to turn the dial to channel three yeah. and to play it back on the TV. It, it um, was, I, I remember walking into the train station, which you guys got, which is now a full pop station in, in Godrich, Ontario, and I, I could hear Diamond Ray disappearance. And anybody that knows the original filmation card, you know, that episode because that's like where most of the characters literally kind of get like an introduction, mm-hmm. right? So I thought, okay, this is kind of fitting all these characters I'm about to meet. You know, this episode playing, it's there. You're like, oh, Rob's here. Hey, how's it going? And then you kind of break down the shot for me, what you're thinking before you kind of finalize the lighting. Like, oh, great. Looks awesome. There it is on the monitor. Kind of chit chat with everybody. And as soon as you were done that rehearsal, whew, there was a yeah. flash behind the TV and, a, and an awesome smell of, you know, burnt oil. 70s I mean, and, tech. And the other thing, too, is we had to the night before we had built that set, which is just two walls. Yeah. Uh, which luckily the grip went down to the theater again, grabbed some flats. We put up some dry, some wallpaper I'd found. We took some paneling out of the, the grip's basement. That carpet found, was found in a dumpster that morning. Yeah. We really, and, and, we and even that's the, the story, right? Because we yeah. lost the location. Yeah. And, and Rand, Rand and Mark were like, oh, it'll work out. We'll just shoot it at the station. And I knew you were like, frustrated. What left of my hair. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I better call Isaac after to make sure that he's going to be able to exist and not well, just combust. A huge a huge issue for me when we're in a, a location or in a, what I would describe as like a wild set yeah, where you're out in the wild and, and there's an owner there and the owner might be tenuous and Isaac's running gear through. And here, sure. here's where he'll have to defend himself. He doesn't care about what the person sees. He doesn't care about the floor and the carpet. Like he's just wants a shot. So I, I care. Be honest. <laughs> I put down rugs. I but you get so like. far up in the, we're doing this, we're doing that. And there's that's this. What, that's what I would call cinematic immunity. I will just go, and, okay, yeah, we're going and, in. Yeah, carte blanche. And I'm, I'm totally concerned about yeah, mediating the, the situation, you know? Agreed. So, so I was so glad that we'd have our home set. We can shoot as long or as, you know, as little as we need to shoot. And we could really, we manufacture the reality that we need yeah. around manufacturing the reality of the shot. From, from cinematography standpoint, that's always better anyway if yeah. you've got the gear and you're in that mode shoot in a studio yeah. you can record or you can control and create the environment from scratch you don't have to worry about when the sun goes up and down yeah. you don't have to worry about what weather it's like outside I was relieved. so so these things especially when when you're shooting in a like a living room environment that's always good anyway because you want it to feel like it's being lit from the outside you want to feel like um, that's the environment's real that he's in but the only thing the, the biggest regret I ha- I have I mean I've, around the the television breakdown was that, you know, okay, poof, the thing goes up. We haul it outside um, because it smells horrible and it's we're worried it's about to, you know, set fire. Turns out that it was actually just the power supply and there was a capacitor sitting on top, which it had heated up and ruptured and it popped and the oil inside of that was burning, uh, smelling, not really burning on fire. And then it, uh, so we couldn't really fix it. There wasn't that many, uh, you know, television repair stations open or stores open. 
<laughs> yeah, the Netflix 1978 <laughs> Electra Home TV. Not that we didn't call people yeah, or, or we, reach we, out to the local neighborhood. So the solution was yeah. we popped the CRT out of the hole. So that's just the tube, the square tube. It's popped right out. And then we put um, film lighting gel, the light frost, white frost, semi-opaque gel in that space. Yeah, kind of like diffusion or something. Yeah, it's a diffusion gel. It was a Hampshire frost to be exact. And uh, cut a oh, hole. Okay, in now the back I feel better that you mentioned. Yeah. That. yeah, Hampshire frost. Cut a hole in the back of the set, put a little projector from Rand's uh, classroom at the school and projected the image back. Projected Flipped it, yeah. Reversed it. We had to yeah. flip the image in post yeah. so that it would project, rear back project in the right way. No, the the only the biggest problem with rear projection, um, and it's a technique that used to be used a lot in special effects filmmaking, like in Terminator, one of my favorite movies. It's like a lot of of that's happening. Um, is that the lens bulb of the of the of yeah. the projector shows up? So, like, even so, if you pass the camera in front of that bulb, you will see it. Yeah, the line of sight, the right spot. Yeah. Yeah. So that was but, my. But do you regret. remember the, the the pitch I made to you for the shot? Uh, we talked original? about starting on like the lunchbox being thrown yep. in, in the in the and then the backpack or whatever. And I'm like, what if we see the trail of the dead? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And this is these are like the foes that He Man's defeated, and yeah. it tells a story by all the up the little the action figure bodies. And unfortunately, we had a real trail of the dead when I stepped on your cringer during the shoot. <laughs> yeah. There's a take. Yeah. When, when I actually was rolling yeah. when that happened, and you step in, you're like, do you want to do Crunch. <laughs> just your foot? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> anyway, actually, that, he so. did, you didn't break it so far. It's actually in the cabinet. It actually looks okay. We'll, we'll find a way to make that up to you, I promise. Oh, Somehow. Okay. He, so. he, he looks just fine. He's right there. But like, uh, How many takes did we do on that shot? Um, I think it's something like in the realm of 20 takes. Um, and, if you, and if you reverse engineer what you wanted to do on location... With the energy oh. that we had in our actor and everything, it's a good thing we only had the one shot because yeah. before we had a shot list of like twenty. I more, actually would argue though that, and, that that the the technical reason that, that we had to do so many takes was more to do with the fact that we were doing the it crane. Was timing. It was timing. It was timing, and I think that <clears throat> yes, we would have had a similar timing issue on location, but I think it would have been solved in a different way. And the problem I was having is that. The way I was operating the crane, and you can see it in the, in the behind-the-scenes footage, is I'm holding onto the side of the, the boom arm, and I'm joysticking the camera head. And I'm not a crane operator. It's a, it's a specific – it's like just because you're a camera operator doesn't make you a really good crane operator or a really good uh, steady cam operator. Those are specific skill sets that you would train to be that. So had we hired a crane operator, and I know some really good ones, you would have had less of that, that problem. Um, so you're – you're moving and joysticking and backing up and all this is also happening and uh, you know the the actor and everything is timing with the screen um, the, so my biggest problem is it's, is the camera's doing this well it's straight it's straight up moving parts you had layers too, of moving too parts too many moving parts yeah. Yeah. yeah but i mean you know yeah there, if it was on set it would have been a whole different you know if we were on that location it would have been a whole different um you know, set of problems. No, I, I like I like what we got better. To be honest, yeah, I think I think we're ahead of the curve. It would yeah. have been different, but I think what we got is a higher value production mm -hmm. wise. Um, yeah, by virtue well, of the fact it was more controllable. It's also just really short, <laughs> which of course yeah. Not, well, but, you wanted it had to be a short film. We, we at one point we were doing a whole short film, <laughs> and then the, we wanted to just get the shot for the trailer, but we thought, well, what if we can make this more for maybe the film. So there was a much larger story, and thankfully, it, it got cut down yeah. for all the right reasons. Well, I think that that I think for for the actual film, which is why I like the, the the few shots I got the next day of just the toys. I think I would go back and do something similar, carry out that that same style into like say capturing elements for the uh, the actual film to display and show the specific toys. I like that where you kind of have a textual environment that isn't. That it that adds to the flavor of what you're looking at, like a, a the plastic toy itself, but not supersedes it. And it's like, well, look at this fancy thing I've built. Like you know, a, say it's like a, a model miniature. You're set. talking like the Conan. Well, it's the the Conan was a, was a, was a good example of it working. Where I think it wasn't working it was great. When, when we did the the miniature city, uh, the first thing we did Correct. with with turtles, because then it's about the set more than it's about the, the, the actual thing you're shooting. So with the Conan, we took um, statues and figures that were um, 
indicative of of the character or the franchise and place them on a stone or something textural and then put textural elements kind it was, of it was more yeah. layered the yeah it makes the media foam core layered. city looked uh yeah. it looked too on the nose it was yeah. what it was yeah and that's always the problem and so, by so the way even though this this is on the nose it's still it's still flavor because it's carpet it's color it's couches it's afghans it's not but um, that's always my concern i'm afraid of on the nose always like that anyway yeah. look we need to uh move on we're at 25 minutes already Perfect. so we need to start thinking about the next thing what do we want to say if if we're going to sum up what we're talking about with this behind the scenes what do we want people to know what do we want them to see the this uh cohen marshall is the young actor he did a great job he yeah. did take after take after take he was a lot able of people came in last it. second to help build yep. stuff and no. Yeah, Shaughnessy yeah. came in, our dancer came in, and she acted as a, what would you call her, a grip defense? <laughs> she was actually like a key grip to keep me from yeah. falling off the back of the box. And we had, uh, what, somebody else popped in. Who else popped in? My dad was there, Ruben was there. Uh, uh, oh, local politician, a former local politician came in just to see what we were doing. Yeah. The, a lot of curiosity. It was good. It's nice when people come in and see everybody working yeah. hard, and, um, you know, the funny thing about filmmaking, it's all all hands on deck. So when yeah. everybody's doing something, uh, and that's probably most of the time, I guess maybe not in a big shoot, there's sometimes you'd see a bunch of people stand around holding coffee and waiting. But in our little group, everybody's working. Somebody walks in, they see it, and they think, oh, this is a busy little spot. It was nice to be in the train station, and it was all good. Yeah, I think I think to maybe sum it up is when you look at that trailer, you got to understand that this is exactly where we're coming from and what we want to do. That crane shot is like, you know, a punch to the emotions. It's it's the starting point for so much of where we're beginning that throwback to why it was important to where we are, because we were those kids in that spot or we know kids that were in, in some of the other cases that was me playing with the toys but then as we transition to the graphic work that mark did with breaking it down and literally going layer by layer by layer deeper and deeper and deeper finding the meaning finding the resonance who are the people that made this possible working backwards that's what you're going to get with this documentary starting yeah. with a place of pure emotion and understanding where that came from and who were the people help that helped make that emotion possible I don't yeah. think we should say anything after that, probably. All right, but maybe in contrast, one thing that we could cut to, uh, which was basically the first kind of meetup with all of us, yeah. was when we were at London Comic Con together, where we sort of started working together, and we just basically thought, hey, why don't we go around, talk to some of the people, some of the vendors here, about what He-Man means to them, what the power of Grayskull is in their opinion, and uh, just you know see what people think, as we announced uh, for the first time mm -hmm. that we were doing this documentary. So now is a good time to cut to some of that footage. Hi, I'm Rob McCallum here at London Comic Con and we're gonna talk to some fans about He-Man and the Masters of the Universe to see who loves them and who has the power of Grayskull. She kinda gave me the eye when I showed her this flyer about her He-Man documentary. I'm doing a documentary on He-Man with you. Yeah. I have the power! Big question though. Yeah. What do you like about He-Man? Which one is He-Man? He was the guy that took care of everything, you know? He-Man was one of my first loves as a child. I think everybody wanted to be He-Man. Even as a girl, I was like, He-Man's awesome. He had the power. I just love the diversity of the characters. Uh, the design work was always amazing. Every time they released a new set of figures, it was just nothing similar to the previous set. Superman, it's an honor to be in your presence. You've met He-Man before. I did meet He-Man. You guys appeared in comics together. They, they narrativized your story. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you like about He-Man? I like that He-Man has a secret identity. Kind of like partial to that whole idea myself. Sure. So you have a secret identity. Yeah, but I'm not telling you what it is. Okay, fair enough. I don't know if it's him specifically, more the characters I love. Okay. I love... Actually, I like She-Ra more than I like He-Man. He-Man and Skeletor, not She-Ra. Why, why not She-Ra? I don't know. I didn't like all the things that girls liked. I liked all the things that boys liked. Uh, they both show a lot of strength, both in character as well as physicality. I started working out about five years ago, and 
slowly en route to becoming Conan slash He-Man, so we'll see. Cool. So you think that there's a similarity between Conan and He-Man? There's, I think there's a, a broad appeal to the whole, you know, barbaric power. Why do you love He-Man so much? Because What? He... Oh! He-Man! I don't think people care who did the voice. It's not one person. I don't think people care who was the artist. I don't think there's the artist. Sure, yeah. And I don't think there's... Like, there's not the narrative behind the narrative of He-Man. So front and center, the relationship that matters there is you were the right age, you saw He-Man, and that relationship is what defines it. So really, the creator of He-Man is the fan. And it just goes on, and Frost, a huge fan favorite, Frost had a crush on He-Man. It was always cool to see them flirt, and He-Man actually sweat under pressure. He-Man didn't uh, like to deal with that kind of pressure. The power of Grayskull couldn't save him from flirting at that point. Adam takes out the sword, holds it up, and says, By the power of Grayskull, I have the power! What does that mean? Fuzzy underpants. Maybe just a lot of testosterone? Roids. It means roids. Some pretty good roids. I have no clue. <laughs> what do you think the power of Grayskull is? She's a low talker. What do you think gives He-Man his power? Marshmallows? Could be a sugar rush. It could be marshmallows. Grayskull is a mystical kind of fortress that the sorceress guards, and I believe it's not unlike the Force in Star Wars. It's like the ultimate power in the universe, and when Adam holds up the sword, the universe power channels through him, and he becomes He-Man, the ultimate warrior in the universe. Like, a kid wants power, and he says straight up, I have the power. And that's what, that's what every kid really wants. You don't have power over your diet, you don't have power over your time, you don't have power over your clothes, you have no decision making. And He-Man as a character represents an archetype of transmutation, right? The boy becomes He-Man, like Shazam. All right, the quest continues here at London Comic Con. Thanks, Take Off. Well, that was London Comic Con, and the quest for He-Man is only just beginning, but we heard from a lot of fans why He-Man is so great, and why people love him so much, and we got a lot of great answers about what the power of Grayskull actually is. But this is just the first stop on a long journey to everything He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Was that them? Did we just see them? Yeah, we just saw them. That was how, it. How did they look? It looked fun. It looked like a lot of fun. I looked particularly fun and oh. funny. <laughs> I thought that I did an excellent job. Wow. Um, <laughs> Good for you. Good job. I thought that I followed you around. and I, I, th I think we all did excellent. And, you know what uh, I particularly did well there? What's that? Remember, I was meeting with someone else at that time, so I wasn't there. No, I think there was one streeter with you and I talking. Is that right? I believe so. Oh, we, we did, that we was great. Seen the footage yet. Oh, we, we did a great seen job. Guts together. We did a great but job. I'm sure we did fantastic Good work. Um, speaking of I'm other of fun adventures that we've had, mm -hmm. uh, Isaac, you did a little bit of a solo road trip adventure, didn't you, recently? Yeah, what? no, it was a it was a good timing. There was a, a little event happening in Toronto. Uh, close. I don't to know if it was so little. It seemed pretty crazy I to was, me. That's just what I was gonna say. Yeah, I, no, it was, I think it, it a, ended up to be pretty big. It was a nice. Yeah. It was a nice event. It was. Uh, uh, a screening of the 1987 uh, live-action Masters of the Universe film uh, held uh, at a Rainbow Cinemas in Toronto. And they were going to do a toy drive uh, run by a uh, the, what would you say, the founder of He-Man World, dot yep. com, is it? Yep. He-Man World dot com. Yeah, John. Uh, John Atkin. And he... Uh, he wanted to run a toy drive for Syrian refugees that are landing in, here in Canada and, and those nice. that, are, that are coming to the, uh, nice. the city of Toronto. And uh, I think he explains that it was uh, something like 400 refugees coming to the city of Toronto this, this, this year. And so he wanted to run a toy drive. So he screened the film and tied that together with a toy drive. So but, it was. But what I love, what I yeah. love, and I've seen the, the rough cuts of this already and ran, I, I think you'll agree. I love that we found somebody really closely connected to us that had never seen. Yeah. Well, this is what I was going to say. The live it, action film. It didn't film. even occur to me. It didn't even occur to me because we were we were so happened to have this trailer ready to go, and we were going to say, okay, yeah. well, let's go down. We'll we'll film some stuff at the place, and we'll show the trailer to the audience, see what they think. And my brother so happened to be helping me on another shoot, 
and Ruben. I said, oh, come on, come on in, Ruben. Let's go, let's go watch this uh, movie. And then halfway out <laughs> to the just to Toronto, I go, have you ever seen this before? <laughs> Here, just, so yeah, so it's, it's he's right cool. here. Let's just let, let, lean in, Ruben. He's cutting it right now, right beside me here. Just he's gonna lean in here. There he is. With perfect objectivity, yeah. Ruben is cutting his own adventure. Yeah, he's cutting it right now. I can <laughs> see it right there. Yeah. He so, is not making any judgments to try and make himself look better or to enhance his role at all. And if you see me looking up, that's by the way my monitor the, where I the see the monitor yeah. above. The work for those either yeah. not sure. So right now I'm looking at a nice shot. Ruben's laughing, and Isaac is looking really smug. <laughs> Sounds about right. As as they drive, <laughs> so I don't. know. It almost is like I'm the big brother. I'm running the show and driving, and Ruben's <laughs> laughing as if to say, <laughs> "You are not." That's I that was frame. driving though. I, I was. Well, that, you, to, L- yeah, let's take a look no at one. what that adventure is like. How it rolled out, and uh, get some of Ruben's thoughts before and after he gets to see Masters of the Universe for the first time. So can I? Can, can we throw that like by something? Can somebody do something to make it happen? Yeah, make do a three count for us, Rand. Three, two, one. Half the time your stuff is out of focus. Are we both framed? Are we in Working frame? on it. Co-pilot. Hey there! Hey I'm there. Ruben Elliott Fisher. I'm Isaac Elliott Fisher. We're, the We're related! Ha! Can't Are you tell? two brothers? No. Yeah! <laughs> We're here today on our way to to see uh, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, the live action film, produced in 1987, directed by Gary Goddard. I don't want to ruin it too much because I don't think you've seen it. I haven't seen it. This is my first time going to see the He-Man future length live action And film. you're gonna get to see it on the big screen. Big screen. Have you ever watched an episode of He-Man? Yeah, yeah, and I remember like, Figuring out that he had this big giant cat that he rode around on, the cat was doing okay, chicken. Probably had... He abused the crap out of that cat, you know? The cat's that was like, actually against the cat. The cat's the like, I, I just, I don't want to do this. Yeah, it's actually true. Like, he's actually pointing the sword at him. He's like, no, I'm scared! <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, no, I don't, I just don't want to be a battle cat today. Just, just, just battle I... cat is more like a big oh. scary cat, Adam. Is a little magic dude in it? Orko, well, at the time, 87, how are you going to make Orko? He's like a faceless, floating dress with a hat. A midget in a costume with a little with no legs, though. He's floating, oh. right? So <laughs> so instead of Orko, they made a rubber um, short person costume. with like It looks like an elf with giant ears and a huge nose. Because he's a key maker, so he's kind of like this tinker guy. I got a cosmic key! <laughs> if I play, we I... can go into this lane. We can go in the lane where two people in a car can go into. Carpool lane! Carpool lane! The power of carpool. I can't. I have the, the power. Um, the power of carpool. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see it again. We're gonna go uh, hang out with another total, totally different big thing. Is we're gonna go premiere the trailer for the Kickstarter. Which by the time that this video is out, the Kickstarter is probably in full swing. Hopefully, everybody's uh, helping support. Just take my credit card. Oh, thank you, Kickstarter. So you tell me, if I was to cosplay a character from He-Man, which one should I cosplay? Not He-Man? Not He-Man, I'm not bulky uh, He-Man. Maybe you could be Tila, or Evil Lynn, or... No, who's his sidekick guy? The guy that wears the helmet and has the mustache. Man-at-Arms? Man-at-Arms. He... The problem with the He-Man toys is they were all sculpted more or less out of the same body, so they're all... all Real the muscular, really big. Like I don't know, maybe like in later adaptations they had different characters have different, different body sizes. So maybe it could be like Mechanek, who's like Mechanek. Mechanek has like this really long neck, like the telescopes up, and uh, and maybe that that to me seems like kind of skinny. No, I tell you. Rock on, here we go, Toronto. We have Masters of the power. Universe screening. Peace. Over and out, Masters of the Universe. Hi everyone, my name is uh, John Atkin and I'm the uh, owner of the website hemanworld.com and tonight at the Rainbow Cinema Market Square we're having a uh, screening of the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe movie from 1987 directed by Gary Goddard. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the 1987 Masters of the Universe movie. Uh, just a few months ago uh, I went down to uh, Los Angeles and uh, I helped a friend of mine um, uh, put together an event, uh, He-Man She-Ra Day. Uh, and we uh, screened this movie and the original Filmation movie, uh, He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword. And uh, it was just an awesome event. And that event inspired me to, 
talk to uh, the theater here and see if we could show Masters of the Universe to a Toronto audience. We wanted to do a toy drive for the Syrian refugees. Right now, Canada has a commitment to the world that uh, we're going to bring in 25,000 refugees from Syria. And uh, just two weeks ago here in the Toronto area, uh, over 400 uh, refugees uh, came to the city. So I contacted Mattel Canada and asked if they might be able to donate some uh, toys to the event. And uh, they gave us 200 toys uh, to give to the children. So it's been really amazing. And uh, on top of that, people coming to the show are also bringing toys too. Um, so we've got a lot of gifts uh, to give the kids, which is uh, really awesome. It's a bit of a late show, um, but I think we're going to get a lot of uh, adult fans who grew up with the, uh, the property coming in tonight. Uh, I was just downstairs and looked like we had about, uh, about 45, 50 people show up so far. And uh, I know uh, the pre-sale tickets uh, online went uh, really well, so I'm expecting a, a good crowd tonight. Isaac is going to be showing a trailer for a new documentary that he's working on on He-Man called uh, uh, Power of Power of Grace. Nineteenth. That's right. So this evening, my editor has been working like crazy this past week to try to get everything ready, um, and it just so happened to coincide with the date of this this event. So I said to John, "Would it be fun to test out this trailer, uh, which is going to go live on the nineteenth um, here in front of you guys?" So I would love to hear what you think after uh, the movie, if you remember after watching the movie. So anyway, thank you very much for hearing me out and uh, enjoy the film. Hello, Kickstarter Nation. I'm writer-director Rob McCallum, joined alongside my good friend. Writer-director Randall Love. And we've been busy shooting all day at Full Pop Station in Goderich, Ontario. What have we been working on? I think we've been working on a teaser to show people at Kickstarter and beyond what they should care about real soon. So take a look at our upcoming teaser trailer for Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Right now. In the early 80s, in the wake of Star Wars, one compelling cartoon and its incredible toy line set a new standard for kids at play. They didn't know who made it or where it came from, and back then, it didn't matter. All they knew was that it gave them something special. Power. He-Man hit the world with an impact as strong as the character himself. But how did that happen? Who created it? And what did it all mean? We're going to show you. For to those that control Grayskull will come the power. That was just a taste. A, just a taste. And the first taste is free. But it's not free anymore. Not if we want to do a great job. Yeah, we can't get this film done without your support and help. You can see a bunch of rewards on the side of the page that can be all yours. They're for the biggest fans out there. It's not just all theirs. We could get that great merch too, can't we? No, it's mainly for them because we need them to help make this movie. So spread the word, consider supporting us, and really just let us make the most powerful documentary in the universe. Make us make it. Yes. We can make it happen. If you want to see us make Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, support us now and tell all your friends. Kickstart! You have the power. Kickstart that mother... We just saw it in theaters. We did. First time for Ruben ever seeing it. <laughs> that was pretty I awesome. I have the power, the power of Skull. I love how everybody clapped when Skeletor gets the power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, that, was, that was really awesome to see it in like a theater with a bunch of people. Some who'd seen it before, some I guess who definitely saw Most it for the first time. Most of them had seen it before. I think like Rob and Lob was like the only guy who hadn't seen it before. 
Yeah, it was definitely uh, pretty bad. <laughs> it was pretty bad, but at the same time, like, really, I got the feeling from it that it had a lot of potential. Yeah. It was just a, a it was kind of like, it definitely felt like a really good movie that was made by a company that was running out of money. But for whatever reason, there's enough heart in that one. Like it's, you could tell that some, like I think Gary Goddard, having met the guy and, and interview, interviewed him before, like he, I think he actually wanted it to be good, legit. And it was like, he, Canon, the film company was going under and. The thing is like, I think Frank Langella like totally saves that movie. Yeah. Yeah, like Frank <laughs> is just like, as Skeletor, even even the bad lines, he's you're just like yeah. <laughs> Death and rebirth, and as you die, so will I be reborn. His his eye acting, his acting was was what sold it. Yeah, but the, there's this like I don't know. Maybe if they gave him like really big contacts. Or something, I think or? I think there was like a, an interview or something I saw somewhere where somebody said like they actually thought about putting him in like a plastic skull prosthetics that were over his face but if you can imagine that would have been like no expression it just would have been yeah. like this jaw that's going up and down yeah, yeah. and then like body movement so if you give him a rubber mask and you let his eyes come out then you're like well now now I see this character in the acting well the, who, the, the, the lizard guy what's his name um Sarad. They had like very very quick shots of him and like his his gullet and his eye his eye uh, uh, he he had contacts. The contacts and they were really convincing. Yep. And I was like I kept I kept trying to see him in the scenes. He was like always in the background. He had like one or two very quick close ups. I'm like he had probably the best costume. Yeah, but I bet it was the most expensive to put on. Yeah, but it was the most expensive to put on. Probably most expensive to, to biggest, wear and biggest, do. Biggest pain first, the he was the first bad guy to get killed. It was a positive nerd experience. High yeah. five. Boom. The power of grey the power! And we're back! We are? That was the Masters of the Universe live action movie adventure with Isaac and Ruben. What did you think? Um, it looked like a lot of fun. This is one of those situations where it's another item on my list of cool things that have happened near my hometown since leaving Canada. And I couldn't go because I had a doctor's appointment because I'm 500 years old. Oh, yeah. okay. But it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Having recently just rewatched that movie, I was like, oh, it's too bad I just rewatched it. It would have been nice to go in uh, a little bit more fresh. But it was totally enjoyable because of the fact that uh, <clears throat> that you're in a room full of people. It's like, it, you, know what, you know what I said to Ruben actually after the fact was, um, the fact that uh, it's kind of like going to see Rocky Horror Picture Show with a bunch of Rocky Horror Picture Show yeah. fans and, like throwing toast at the screen. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody's laughing at the exact right moments and 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 clapping when when uh, Skeletor gets the power because <laughs> it's just Longella is so obviously yeah. the the hero of that movie. <laughs> it re it really shows how cool this community is. And again, thanks to John for letting us come and oh, yeah. shoot and show the trailer uh, for our Kickstarter campaign in advance. Yeah. Everybody that we've met in this community is so awesome and so positive about everything He-Man. It's it's really cool that, you know, some other communities, I'm going to say, it are, are divided and have the BS. This is very unified, and we're very happy. Everybody mm -hmm. is really cool behind the scenes and welcoming. I got invited into, I think, three or four different He-Man and, and Masters of the Universe groups on Facebook, and it's super positive. It's awesome. It's very refreshing that we're a part of that. Well, my cousin, Robin, went there, and I think he sat with you, Isaac. Yep. If, yeah. And he doesn't know anything about, or he, I shouldn't say that. He, he doesn't know much about He-Man. He doesn't know about the culture around it. And he called me afterwards, and he said, man, you really missed it. It was a lot of fun. And he said, the people there were super great. They obviously care about more than He-Man because they came with, you know what I mean? came with gifts. They wanted to be part of it, and I think they... Loved the issue. They loved being there. I think you really captured that too, didn't you, Isaac? Yeah, it was a really positive experience because, like you said, not only were people bringing gifts and everything, but it wasn't like nobody was making fun of. Let's be let's be honest. It's a 1987 movie, kind of made low budget by a company that was going under. It's a bit so campy. It's campy. Th it was campy, but but it was like being able to laugh at yourself, being able to laugh at the thing that you love, but you still love it. It was it was a lot of fun. I think it was with reverence and respect. And it was uh, it was an enjoyable process. Nobody was like booing or groaning or wanting to leave. It was like the the bad campy lines. Everybody loved it, you know. 
and and everybody laughed and everybody enjoyed. Must have been nice for you too, having spoken with Gary Goddard last summer, right? When we were yeah, doing Conan. Yeah. Listen to how Isaac dropped this ball and ate ate his own face right in front of me. He was Amazing. sitting there behind the camera, so we're very close together. And and there's Gary in front of me, and I'm talking to Gary, and Isaac's head is drifting up. And, he, and you see him come back down, and I see him. He's really close, right? And I see him go, <laughs> and down again, and then and then all of a sudden he goes. Oh, <laughs> I love oh. it. Yeah, that certainly didn't sound like Isaac's version of the story. <laughs> yeah, but he goes, oh, and his head sinks. How did I not? How did I not and bring I said, a what copy? What are you talking about? Here. Yeah, how, and that's what he said. How did I not bring a copy? And Gary, Gary we probably have Gary on camera going, <laughs> yeah, that's my movie. <laughs> <laughs> and Isaac just... But the thing is, in Isaac's defense, we're there for Conan, right? Yeah, you're in the and culture. He-Man keeps popping up, but you're in a mindset. You're just so focused. So I, I totally get that, right? It makes sense. There's a lot of stuff that's you find a lot of crossover in all these pop culture uh, interviews we do. David Wise, we talked well, to for well, Turtles. Even Mark, yeah, he's who's in He-Man. He-Man. And yeah. even the design of the sewer play set for Turtles, yeah, right? That's right. Grayskull being a reference for that, yeah. having some sort of deity in the wall, yeah. you know? <laughs> Oh, I mean, I, I mean, there's this, there's toy designers, like key toy designers. From yeah. him that we came across their designs in sure. Turtles Land, and then all of a sudden afterwards making that connection, or yeah. or Cam Clark not even realizing, yeah. oh yeah, Cam Clark it's, totally voiced. It's never going to stop. Man who prints on him. Never yeah. going to yeah. stop happening. Something I want to point out just before we wrap here, Rob, you brought something up, and I don't know if this is the time to say it or not. You can decide if we should cut this out. But uh, when you talk about the community, when you put that up on the uh, He Man Facebook that we have, the documentary Facebook page, all mm-hmm. that kind of interest in sending art in, and more than interest, people yeah. sending art in, that, that yeah. proves what you were saying. I just wanted to bring that up. No, there's no reason to cut that. Okay. I mean, we put, an, we put an open call on Facebook and in Twitter, you know, send us your interpretations of Castle Grayskull, mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. specifically Grayskull, and however you see it and whatever it means to you, mm-hmm. whatever style you like, whether it's pencil, whether it's ink, whether it's acrylic, watercolors yeah. send us how you see grayskull we'd love to have the option to maybe include it in a segment for one of these episodes or maybe even put it in the film but send it to us and you know we'll probably send you back a material release saying hey is it cool if we use this kind of going forward we want to see it i don't care if you think grayskull is full of rainbows and unicorns and all that stuff and super happy fun well it is or if you think it sure or if it's like super dark and evil and dripping with uh primordial ooze whatever you like yeah, yeah. The stuff there's a, that there's came been in. some cool stuff. There's yeah, it was amazing. Cool amazing. Yeah. yeah. So we, start, we, we love it. Did you start to realize, oh, some of these people are artists. Like, they're not just yeah. fans. That's not some guy at home who's, like, watching the He-Man uh, series over and over again and just, that's it, eating Cheetos and, and I don't and know. Tra- and tracing Grace yeah. off the TV screen. No, you, know, you know what it reminds me right. of is, is I remember doing an interview with some fans at Golden Apple Comics in L.A. way back. Mm. And I remember interviewing a young graphic designer. Yeah, totally. And, and, and it was like a lot of these, a lot of these yeah. franchises, He Man, Turtles, um, you know, there's it's no it's no um, you know, coincidence that these young people have been inspired by the art of it and then carry that into their careers and carry that forward, even at, or or even just as a hobby, like myself. I mean, this is just really a hobby. But I I totally attribute some of that inspiration to shows like He-Man, shows like Turtles, where you know the typesets, the typography. It's these are designed by highly skilled artists, and and like I even was and talking a lot of about, big names. Yeah, big names. Know. I mean, I mean, Boris Vallejo did did uh, did a cover of one of the recent uh, Image books. Well, not recent, but the last couple of years. You know, that's huge. It, or or the the bigger names that inspire guys like Rudy Ribera's box art paintings and stuff like that i mean these even the toy designers obviously are des- are like big fans of sci-fi and pop culture and heavy metal magazine and star wars and you know what i mean like it's all you know it's all this big melting pot to and me it's, it's that, totally inspirational that that's that idea that these franchises aren't just franchises and they aren't just to be consumed they're to be participated with that's exciting as a you know, if someone said, what's one of the things that you would look at in a definitive film? One of the things that we do is we see how these pop culture icons translate through the fans and through the artists and creators who participate in this franchise. And I would say you two are evidence of that. I'm pointing at you on another monitor, but, you know, Isaac grows up 
and he's become part of the turtle story. Rob grows up, he becomes part of the N- Nintendo story, and now that love is being transferred through He-Man. And, and I won't lump myself in with that with some of the franchises we do, because as I s- have said a million times, I'm 7,000 years old. But uh, this idea that, I don't want to say you turn the camera around and now you're shooting yourself as you shoot He-Man, but you know what I'm getting at. You get to be working with the franchise in some way, working with the characters in some way, like many of the people that we talk to. It's fun. You haven't mentioned it yet, but it's kind of like the Venn diagrams. Oh. <laughs> that, that, you, you use that analogy and Isaac pointed out, you know, I only think you mentioned Venn diagrams when you're talking to Rob, but it's all these circles. Maybe you got self-conscious and didn't want to bring it up. I don't, I don't use it or not use it consciously. It just pops up. What I'll talk about is the dialectic this time. Sure. That's what I'll say. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. That's dialectic. a good one. Pop culture dialectic. I like that. It. You have the the thing itself, and then it's sort of like you have the opposite. You have the consumption of the thing, and then you have the people who do the creation of the thing. So that's sort of the opposite of consumption is creation, and it creates something new. The synthesis of those two activities becomes some new and exciting form. So here's a good example for me. When... Um, I'm talking to someone who watched the new Star Wars movie, and maybe we've talked about this, and they said they didn't like it because it wasn't canon, or somebody saw something in it who didn't treat the Jedi properly or whatever. And I would always say, I like new iterations. I like to see other people's ideas. I like when versions break rules. Uh, I'm, I'm not too worried about stuff like that. I can watch uh, Game of Thrones and different things happen. I'm excited by that because I can always go and read the books. I get my interaction with it. It's just for me, but I want to see other people's interactions become valuable and be transferred into whatever pop culture currency they think is cool. And so that's what's really fun when you put that uh, Facebook post up, just seeing this stuff kind of, I wouldn't say flood in, but quite a bit of stuff has come in. It's pretty yeah. exciting. Right. Anyway, listen, uh, artists, right, so artists work with everything. Up. Let's wrap, wrap it up. this up, guys. Um, if I you haven't it checked there. it out already, go on Kickstarter, search Power of Grayskull, visit our our website hemandoc.com all the links are there help us get to the finish line let us make the most definitive documentary on he-man and the masters of the universe we really need your help uh, we hope you've enjoyed the adventures that we've had pop, our chat. By, pop by our facebook page and uh if you've yeah. got some art you want to share with us please do share that please do and uh so for me rob mccallum as always thanks for listening and watching guys uh isaac elliott fisher yes thank you everybody and uh and check back often and take it home for us, Rand. Well, we're going to tail out by saying, yes, you saw Mark Hussey leave. He had to head out quickly, so we can't cut to him, and he hasn't been doing any of his fancy cuts. But he wanted me to let you know he's excited about this. Thank you very much for watching this, and thank you very much for your support on Kickstarter. And we're really excited to see what comes out of all this. Take care, and we'll talk soon. For those that control Grayskull will come the power.